to use this opportunity to talk to you about the crime that is slavery that is plaguing our country. So often when I get up to speak, I see faces just as yours are staring back at me as if to say, but Abby, I'm an American. I'm from Massachusetts and we haven't had slavery within our borders for many a year now. And in the legal form, you would be right. Indeed, slavery has not been legally san sanctioned in our Commonwealth since 1783, when Mr. Quark Walker sued for his freedom. Mr. Walker had himself originally been a slave, and upon his master's death, he was promised his freedom. But when his master passed away, Mr. Walker was not freed, but instead became the property of his, uh, his master's wife's new husband, who did not treat Mr. Walker well. This being the case, Mr. Walker chose to run away to take his freedom into his own hands. He was found, returned, and brutally beaten for claiming the freedom that he had been promised. Well, Mr. Walker took his case to court and alongside other African Americans suing for their freedom as well, his case and the case of his brothers and sisters was found to be unconstitutional in accordance to the Massachusetts Constitution, passed just a few years prior in 1780. Mr. Walker was granted his freedom, and slavery was decided legally to no longer be within, Amer within Massachusetts borders. But this feigned ignorance that our hands are thus washed of the crimes of slavery is not true. Our brothers and sisters think of, of the most humble among us I think first of the mothers. Mothers, close your eyes for me and think of your children, grown if they are now, but think of them small. Think of the moments when the tears would, would flow so easily from their faces and how simple it was for you to come up to them, scoop them up in your arm and hold them tight. Think of the comfort that your arms gave to your child. Think of taking Maybe the simplest of things, an old quilt, soft and worn from years of use. Think of wrapping that around your babe, holding that babe to your heart, and feeling its body soften, its heart start to beat with yours, knowing the calm, warm, loving embrace of its mother, and how soothing that is to its very soul. Now think, mothers, of the Negro mother in the South, who cannot pick up and hold its babe, for that babe was taken away from her by no fault of her own. Think of the way her heart beats to just know for a second that her child had the warmth, the comfort, the safety of its mother's arms. Think how she wishes to hold that child so dearly to just know that it will be safe, it will be raised with those who love her. And think of the quilt such a simple thing. We have quilts in all of our homes, cast aside in trunks, put up for the future generation. Think of the cotton, so soft and warm from use. And think of that Negro child, growing four, five years old, who doesn't feel the warmth and comfort of that quilt, but instead feels the lash on its back, the warm sun on his shoulders, the tear in his eye as he picks that cotton that gets shipped out so up to the north to make our lives so comfortable, so easy, and keep our children so safe. And tell me now, have we truly washed our hands of the trials of slavery? I know in your heart of hearts you cannot say yay. 
And fathers, I appeal to you as well, or sons as the case may be. Think of your sons, think of your brothers. Think of the boys coming back from the field, their arms and backs strong with the day's labor. Think of how proud you are to see them come into the house, to see their brows wet with sweat, to see the fields cut behind them. And think of the pride that swells in your heart, getting to know that every day they work a day with the family. And think instead of the Negro father, equally proud, equally happy for his son's labor, his son's work. And think of that father not get to welcome his son back with open arm every night for that same virtue of which you praised your son, promised him the highest price on the auction block. That that boy, from nothing more than following the rules of his father and following the rules of his master, has been taken from his family, never to see them again, and is sold to a plantation many, many miles away. And tell me, are you still free of the pains of slavery that are in our country? I think it cannot possibly be so. Even on the simplest of moments, I think of the very morning when you awake with your family, of the meal set on your table, the, the foods that abound that fill your stomachs, and the sweet sugar that sweetens your coffees and teas. And think of the Negro child who suffers so that sugar can be so cheaply in your cup. And tell me, have we truly washed our hands of slavery? I have never myself seen a slave. You might say to me, you might say, Abby, how can I be at fault? I've never met a slave, never seen a plantation, maybe never even met anyone who had seen slavery or plantation themselves. And I, for many years, had not either. Uh, until my association with Miss Grimke, who had grown up herself a, a child of, of privilege in the South. The, the plight of the slave in the truest form, from the lips of one who had seen it, had not been something that graced my ears. But does that make me any less guilty? I don't think it is so. And some may say that we can help our Negro brothers and sisters by taking not those who were enslaved down in the South, not those who suffer day in and day out, not those who, for whom freedom never tolls and for, the, for whom the sun never truly rises. But instead, we can take our Negro brothers and sisters who have fought their way to freedom, who have fought their way up north, and we can remove them to back to Africa, to the new country of Liberia. This idea of exporting our brothers and sisters, many of us here in the North say that this is equality, this is freedom. But can separate ever truly be free? By taking any of us and isolating us from the community, as were the lepers in the Bible, were they free? Were they loved as much as God's other children? Again, I say to you, nay. And more so, we haven't had the slave trade in this country since 1808. Our brothers and sisters who labor and suffer in the South, they are no more Africans than I am Irish for my father came from those shores, or his father then. They are Americans, as true as you and I. And they deserve the promise of America just as I do, and just as you do as well. Again, I reach out to the mothers, fathers, children among us. I want you again to think for a second at that babe, so safe so comfortable at that mother's breast. And think of how little a gesture those warm arms are that the Negro parent cannot offer their child. And what can we do in the North? How can we change that? Some things are simple. Could it be simply to not lend our dollar to that which enslaves the slave? Could we not buy the cottons and buy the sugars and take dependence off of, of Southern slavery? Can we not reach out our hand to our brother and sister once they reach our shores? How hard would it be 
to take that Negro mother who has made her struggle up to the north and to embrace her like you would any brother and sister here, to take her into your, or, or your home, to feed her and her child, and to send a message to all of your brothers and sisters that God has made us each and all equal, each in his image, not just the white, but also the black. And again, I see your eyes looking up at me quizzically, and you must wonder how a lady as young as I has come to a point where I, I would stand in front of my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, and proclaim such a radical thing as the immediate abolition of slavery, the only thing worth proclaiming from these shores. And if you would allow me a second of vanity, I, I would like to be able to tell you a little bit about my life as well. May I do so? Thank you. I, I myself was raised here in Massachusetts. I was born in Pelham in, in 1811. I find myself now to be all of 26 years of age. And I was raised in a family of, in the society of friends. Hence, as you might have noticed, my slightly unusual dress. My family were, were Quakers and my father of Irish origin. So we were outcasts in our own town in a way as well. Though I was born in Pelham, within my first year we moved to Worcester, Massachusetts. So I suppose you could really consider that the town of my youth. I grew up there, a large family as most of you I'm sure did as well. And my parents did their best to educate myself and my brothers and my sisters. They sent us to the, the public schools in Worcester. And when I had reached my teens, as a lady I had received all the education that Worcester County could grant me. But my parents were, were willing to give me more. They sent me off to Providence, Rhode Island to attend the Friends School there. And I was so thankful for the education I received that I, I perpetuated it myself, going back and forth to keeping school and, and educating myself, and keeping school and educating myself, and, and did so until I had achieved all the education that Rhode Island could give me as well. The United States even, short of moving all the way west to Ohio and, and taking classes at Oberlin College, the only one that's now started to receive female students. And this education was so important to me that I got work to make sure my brothers and sisters, female and male alike, could share in the same educational prospects that I had. And then, having put them along their way, I moved for the first time truly away from my parents' house to Lynn, Massachusetts. And has anyone got a chance to be to the city of Lynn? It's a beautiful city of industry. As far as I could see when I first left the coach were little homes with sort of small lean-tos off the back where people sat busily making shoes. And I thought, what wonderful industry! all these shoes being made for the people of Lynn and the people of Massachusetts. But as I learned more, those shoes weren't gracing the feet of our brothers and sisters in Massachusetts. They were being sold by the pile down to the south, where they covered the feet of our black brothers and sisters who labored in the fields. Our brothers and sisters in the north in Massachusetts, a state that touts freedom, was making its money by selling shoes to slave plantations in the South? It, it was a bit of a shock to me. And while I was in Lynn, I, I took a job keeping school, as I had done before, and I made friends with some other ladies my same age who were a bit different than the ladies who had befriended me in, in, in Worcester. They were members of a group called the American Anti-Slavery Society. And they were also followers of a gentleman named um, Sylvester Graham, who is a, a dietary reformist you might have heard of. He has this wonderful cracker that, oh, what is it? I think they're just calling them Graham's crackers, that he thinks is a much more helpful alternative to some of the things we've been eating. In particular, abstaining from a lot of alcohol, warm breads, um, meats, and, and other stimulating foods. And I can admit I do feel better for it. And as far as the anti-slavery society, that opened my eyes up to even more interesting ideas and in people. In particular, my friends brought me to see one gentleman speak, uh, Mr. William Lloyd Garrison. 
And if you have not yet had the chance to see Mr. Garrison speak, I implore that you do so at your soonest opportunity. For Mr. Garrison is not only a, a skilled writer, but a wonderful orator as well, and his words inspired me instantly. And as I, I worked more of the American Anti-Slavery Society, or I should say our, our small female chapter in Lynn, I started to become more involved and more interested. We circulated petitions, trying so hard to see what could women do to change things from a little town like Lynn. But there was a petition being circulated that very year by the American Anti-Slavery Society that hoped to bring apart the end of the sale of slaves in the District of Columbia. And we circulated around Lynn, and I swear every lady of Lynn must have signed it at least twice for the number of petitions we received back and sent them off to Washington, D.C., in hope that our voices could be heard. And then my friends sent me to a larger convention in Massachusetts of the American Anti-Slavery Society, where I met not only with other ladies, but with gentlemen as well including Mr. Garrison himself, and what a joy it was to get to meet and speak with him in person. We talked and we talked, and the more I talked with him and the other members of the American Anti-Slavery Society, the more my view started to open, and the more I thought that maybe some of the things I had believed weren't quite true. As I said, I grew up in a, a friend's house, a Quaker household, so I did grow up with a sense of equality, not only between men and women, for when we have our meetings, we sit together in silence, allowing both genders to stand up and speak what God has to say inside of them. But also an equality between races, that there does not have to be a hierarchy between the native and the black and the Irish and the white, but instead that maybe we are all equal. But I also started to, to pick up in my earlier days of learning about anti-slavery that idea of colonization, that idea that maybe we could improve the lives of our brothers and sisters by sending them out of America and back into their home country. But as I talked to Mr. Garrison, I, re I started to realize that that separate could never truly be equal, that our brothers and sisters in the South don't deserve freedom as it manages to come to them, but deserve their freedom today, if not yesterday, for all that they had suffered. And talking among ourselves, Mrs. Gr Ms. Grimke and uh, the gentleman and, and I, we decided that we should hold our own meeting and that we would use the newly erected Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to have a, our first convention in which I would truly speak. Not that the convention was held for me, mind you, but my first opportunity to really get up and speak. And the, the building, as I said, had just been finished, funded largely by the American Anti-Slavery Society in an attempt to have a place where anyone could speak about anything they wanted to, a true open forum. And we would have us ladies a two-day convention where we would just discuss peacefully the ideas of anti-slavery. And the gentlemen were also intrigued, and we invited them to come along as well. And we would, we would meet together then, brother, sister, white, black, to discuss what we could do to help end the, the plight of our brothers and sisters in the South. So when we got together to meet at that hall, this was, as I said, the first time I ever truly got up to speak in front of a public forum. And I can say it was not what I expected. Walking in that morning arm in arm with my, my, some of my dearest of friends from the American Anti-Slavery Society, I was not met by calm, friendly faces as you meet me now, but I was met by men and women who were angry to see us there, who didn't want this group of, of radical abolitionists as they screamed in our faces in their town upsetting their streets and upsetting their people with their ideas of anti-slavery. So we didn't walk in heads high and proud as I expected, but low and quickly to avoid the mobs. And when we got inside, I was amazed by how loud the din of the people outside was when it echoed in the hall. When my first sister got up to speak, I must have sat no farther away from her than you sit from me but I could barely hear a word from her lips 
because the sound from outside was just so heavy in our ears. So when it was my turn to speak, I had no way of knowing if anyone had, could hear a single thing I had to say. But when I had finished and I went to return to my seat, my dear friend, Mr. Theodore Weld, stopped me along the way. He is a wonderful thinker and, and, and speaker in his own right, may I tell you. And Mr. Weld said to me, he said, Abby, if you do not continue to speak out against slavery, God will surely smite you. <laughs> okay. So I sat back down, and I listened for the rest of the day, and I went home, Mr. Weld's words still ringing in my head, and I sat in silence, and I thought of them all night. And the next morning, we went back. And this time, people were angrier, louder, yelling and hissing and jeering at us, throwing rocks at us as we went to walk in. And so, so quickly, quickly, quickly did we get ourselves inside. And we continued the second day of our meeting. And as the day progressed, the crowds did not settle out, but quite the opposite. They became louder, rowdier. They started to bang on the doors. They started to beat on the windows, throw rocks at the building. And eventually, as our day was winding to the close, the first rock made it through the glass and broke a window, and then another, and then another. And so quickly we all left, not high and proud, but running, running from a meeting where we wanted to speak of just peace for our brothers and sisters. And safely we all did get out, but once we had em emptied the building, other men came. They beat down the doors and they let the building on fire, and they watched it start to burn. I couldn't understand. And even more radical still, once the building was ablaze, the, the Philadelphia Fire Department came, and I thought then surely things would be put into, into their right place. You know, the, the officials are here. They'll tell these men what to do. They'll, they'll put things right. But the fire department coming with their pump truck did not immediately start dousing the building, but instead did they stand in front of it and watch as well. I can only think now that they came to make sure that the job was done well, to make sure that the building burned. But why? I couldn't understand. This was only a year ago now, my 20s, I had never speak in, spoken in front of an audience like this before. How could a group of men and women in Pennsylvania, in a free state, the state that was once the head of our country, how could they be that angry to see a group of ladies and gentlemen talk passively about embedding the lives of our brothers and sisters enslaved in the South? How? Well, I, I did what anyone does at that time, and I went home. I went back to Worcester. I met with my mother and father, and I told them what had happened. I told them about the, the building, about the mobs, and about the, the, the noise and the rocks and the fire. And I told them about Mr. Weld and what he told me, and that God would smite me if I didn't keep speaking about slavery, but how could I keep speaking about slavery if, if they're going to attack us for doing so? What was I supposed to do? And do you know what my parents did? They supported me. They told me that, Abby, that this is what God wants for you. And I am not one to question God's will. So I sat down with myself, and I decided that what I had to do was I had to spend every moment of my life from that day to the end of my days until the crime of slavery was wiped from our country fully and that there was nothing worth fighting for more so than that. And if you met Abigail Kelly when she was about my age, so in the 1830s, that is where she stood. So, you know, let's put her at all of 26 years old, and she's decided she's going to give up any semblance of a normal life 
so that she can help this group of people who live, for her time period, a world away, weeks and weeks by coach, that she's never met before, have a better life for themselves. She does what she discusses with her parents. She actually sells almost all of her possessions um, so that she can give the money to the American Anti-Slavery Society, keeps a few gowns and simple things to herself, continues to dress as her sort of Quaker roots dictated in, in sort of simple gowns and browns and almost entirely wools and silks so she didn't have to give any money to the, the cotton industry that you know, hurt her, her brothers and sisters in the South. So, And she started to tour. And she spoke, and she spoke, and she spoke. And this is at a time where ladies only speak to ladies, where the most that I should be doing is getting up in front of just the ladies in this group and speaking passively with you. The audacity to speak in front of gentlemen as well. And there were times where she would get up to speak, and there were gentlemen in the audience that came not to hear her, but the sheer thrill that a lady was speaking in public about something as radical as anti-slavery. And as she, she toured and spoke, she did meet with people who were sympathetic and who wanted to hear her, as you are so kind to listen to me. But it seemed just as common, if not more so, she was met with adversary time and time and again. There are so many stories of Abby going to get off a coach in a, a town no different than this town. And there are crowds knowing she's coming, waiting at the tavern where the coach is with you know, baskets of rotten fruit to throw in there and make sure she doesn't step off that coach into their town. The number of times it's noted that she gets up in a meeting house, in the very place where you share God's word, and she rents the space to speak, and people take the missiles, the, the little books of the word of God, and they chuck those at her as well to get her to silence herself when she's speaking. They're so upset at what this young girl has to say about ending slavery. But like I said, she's not on her own. She, she meets with so many wonderful people that help and support her. Mr. Garrison, who I mentioned before, Angelina Grimke and her sister, Frederick Douglass makes her, her, her friendship as well. A whole world of people. And eventually she meets a gentleman named Stephen Foster when she's out touring. And not that Stephen Foster writes the music, another Stephen Foster. And he had actually been excommunicated from his church for his sort of radical um, approach to things. And he had been fighting for anti-slavery as well. Abby, being a Quaker, was a pacifist. Uh, Mr. Foster was a bit more physical about his fight to end slavery. But they met and they got married in secret off on their, their anti-slavery tours. Um, they married in a very small audience of just a couple friends. And in one of the first radical moments of their relationship, they sign a, a, a wedding document in private that says, should the marriage not be fruitful for either of them, that it's just immediately abolished and nothing else has to be done with it after that. But Abby and Stephen have no need to abolish their, their relationship. They, if you could even call it that, they sort of go on their honeymoon, continuing to speak about sla anti-slavery. They speak up and down the East Coast. They actually collectively go out to Oberlin College, which I mentioned before, the college in the, the western frontier. Ohio's the western frontier of America at the time. Um, to speak to the ladies who are attending that college and the gentlemen about anti-slavery. And why she's there, a woman from West Brookfield, Massachusetts, Lucy Stone, who had gone all the way out to Ohio herself, hears her speak and is inspired by Abby speaking. And both her and Stephen find themselves arrested for that speaking engagement, as they are many times over, by people in free states who are that upset that you have, a, a, in this case now, a man and a woman speaking out against slavery. <laughs> And there are many times when Abby's attacked, verbally and physically. There's stories of Stephen being nearly lynched for times that he's gotten up and started his own side of ending slavery. And it's hard. And then one day, there's this wonderful letter Abby's writing to a, a friend where she says, you know, despite loving Stephen and their relationship, that she doesn't think she could ever be a mother because she could not nearly split her need to fight for her brothers and sisters in the South. 
and to properly raise a child, but soon figures out that she is expecting. And I think for Abby, she probably had to make what might have been the hardest decision of her life up to then. She had to stop because she had to have this child. So her and Stephen buy a piece of property in Worcester, Massachusetts, up on Mower Street. It's still there. It's now called Liberty Farm. It's a private home, but occasionally they'll open it up for people to see. And they do their best to become normal citizens, with Stephen still going out and speaking occasionally, and Abby occasionally going out to speak, but with no means of the routine nature that they had been before. And Stephen just starts to get tired of sort of this constant fight. And Abby, despite loving her child, this, this little girl they affectionately called Alla, very, very dearly, just can't watch this battle that meant so much to her pass on without her. So in probably the most radical moment of their relationship or most relationships for the time period, they switch. Stephen decides he'll stay home. He'll raise Alla. He'll do that part so Abby can go out and keep speaking. She speaks at the first Worcester Women's Rights Convention. She speaks at its 30th anniversary. She speaks and she speaks and she speaks. She speaks through the passing of the 13th Amendment, which outlaws slavery across the country. She speaks through the Civil War. And when a lot of her companions, Mr. Garrison included, when the, the 13th Amendment passes and the Civil War rounds to an end, have sort of felt like they've done their part and step aside, Abby keeps speaking, and she keeps fighting. Now her brothers and sisters are free. They deserve the rights of, of white brothers and sisters. They deserve to, to be a full vote, not three-fifths of a vote. And even when she, she reaches her older age, she dies at 76 years old, and she's living in, in back at Liberty Farm with Stephen. Her and her husband refuse to pay taxes on their house until their black brothers and sisters get the same vote, or at least their black brothers, as their white brothers do. And multiple times, the town of Worcester evicts them from their home for not paying taxes, and their friends pay to put them back in. So that way, they don't have to sort of break with their principle. And near the very end of Abigail Kelly's life, when she's sort of at her oldest age, when she spoke at that, that, second, that 30th anniversary of the Women's Rights Convention, Everyone there wrote that she could barely speak over a hoarse whisper, for she had destroyed her vocal cords, just screaming over audience after audience after audience. And her husband wrote maybe the most beautiful thing I've ever seen anyone write about another human being. And he said that if, he, if God could grant him anything in the world, that what all he wanted was for God to give his wife back her voice for just a few weeks more, so that many more people could hear the amazing things she had to say. So I, I would thank you all so much for coming to talk to me ab about Abby, and I hope that you, you look back into her. There's a wonderful biography called Ahead of Her Time, which I saw a couple people walk in with, um, that's absolutely amazing, and a couple other things that mention her. But, so please pick those up, read them, and thank you so much for speaking with me. A song. How can we sing King Alpha's song in a strange land? Father Wicked, carry us away, captivity. Carry us away from us a song. How can we sing King Alpha's song?